Today, I want to tell you about five national parks that no longer exist. Some are now state parks, some are still within the national park system but just carry different designations, and some have been transferred out of the National Park Service altogether. A lot of you have actually written in about this, and I am happy to oblige to give you answers to your most pressing questions. If you have a topic you'd like to see covered here on National Park Diaries that you think would make a good topic for the channel, do be sure to leave a comment down below. Your suggestions are always appreciated. Also, a disclaimer. I'm only covering places which have actually carried the full National Park designation in this video. So no national monuments, historic sites, memorials, or things of that nature. I have already covered a few of those places anyway, like I did a video on Fossil Cycad National Monument and a video on Mar-a-Lago National Historic Site. So be sure to check those out if you're interested. But if you would like to see another video with the full list of deauthorized parks, or if you'd just like to see deeper dives into any of the parks we're going to talk about today, do leave a comment about that also. All right, that's housekeeping out of the way. Let's get started. I first want to start with the three national parks that are still under the National Park Service umbrella. Remember that there are 19 different types of national parks in the United States, something I've also talked about here on the channel before. These three parks previously held the quote-unquote full title of National Park, but have since been moved around into other parts of the system. The first park we're going to talk about is Lincoln National Park, or what we know today as Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Historical Park. Before that, it was known as the Abraham Lincoln Birthplace National Historic Site, and before that, it was just known as Abraham Lincoln National Historical Park. So, this park has seen its fair share of name changes and administrative tomfoolery. But regardless of what it's been called, the purpose of this park has really remained the same for its entire existence, even before it became a national park at all. Its purpose has been to preserve the birthplace of America's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Honest Abe was born here in rural Kentucky in 1809 before going on to become one of America's great leaders. Years after his assassination in 1906, the Lincoln Farm Association was formed with the express goal of preserving the place where Lincoln was born. In 1916, the association donated the land to the federal government. It was at this time that it became Lincoln National Park. But it only carried this designation for a few short years. In 1939, the park was redesignated as Abraham Lincoln National Historical Park in order to better fit what it was preserving, a smaller, more historically focused area. In fact, Fort McHenry, the next park on our list, has kind of a similar story. This historic fort has sat in Baltimore Harbor since the Revolutionary War and was in use by the United States military all the way through World War II. Its most famous moment, though, came during the War of 1812, when the British, having already burned Washington, D.C., set their sights on Baltimore. Fort McHenry withstood a British naval onslaught for more than 25 hours before the British just ran out of ammunition and retreated from the harbor. In the aftermath of the Battle of Baltimore, a lawyer by the name of Francis Scott Key, upon seeing the flag of the United States still flying atop Fort McHenry's walls, having survived the entire bombardment all through the night, he was inspired to write a poem. Titled The Defense of Fort McHenry and set to the tune of To Anacreon in Heaven, this song would become the Star Spangled Banner, and later the United States National Anthem. He later recalled that, quote, In that hour of deliverance and joyful triumph, my heart spoke. Does not such a country and such defenders of their country deserve a song, was its question. It was in this context that preservation efforts first began for Fort McHenry. It was seen as a priceless part of the American mythology, the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner, an indelible piece of American history. It was protected as a national park in 1925, but like Lincoln National Park, was redesignated in 1939 to better fit its smaller, more historic focus. Fun fact though, Fort McHenry is the only doubly designated national park unit in America, carrying the title of both national monument and historic shrine, which 
also makes it the only shrine in the national park system. All right, moving on to Platt National Park, the forgotten national park of Oklahoma. This place was technically America's seventh national park, having been designated as the Sulphur Springs Reservation in 1902 before becoming Platt National Park in 1906. Located in south central Oklahoma, Platt is a holdover from the golden age of hydrotherapy. The reason for its preservation was pretty similar to that of Hot Springs National Park, which was actually first set aside way back in 1832. Both had water that was thought to possess healing powers. In the case of Hot Spring, this healing was really centered around bathing, but at Platt, the water was more for drinking. This area of Oklahoma is home to more than 32 major springs, supplying fresh, cold water to an area that is otherwise just pretty dry overall. Even before Platt was named a national park though, it was a wildly popular tourist destination, again, because of those aforementioned healing powers. This popularity continued well after it became a national park as well. In fact, in 1914, Platt had more visitors than both Yellowstone and Yosemite. Despite its success though, Platt was kind of like picked on by park leaders and politicians who didn't necessarily think it was worthy of national park status, even though many of them loved and expressed admiration for hot springs. Like there were 11 different attempts to delist Platt as a national park, all of which failed until 1976 when it was absorbed into the Chickasaw National Recreation Area upon completion of the Arbuckle Dam and Lake of the Arbuckles. So those three, like I said, all remain under National Park Service protection in some form to this day, just not as national parks. These next two, though, have moved out of the national park system completely. Mackinac National Park was the second ever national park in America, designated only three years after Yellowstone and a full 15 before Yosemite and Sequoia. Located in the Straits of Mackinac off the coast of Mackinac City, Michigan's Mackinac Island became a national park in 1875. And yes, all of these are pronounced Mackinac, not Mackinac. I see all of you who are ready at your keyboards to correct me, but you can take the day off on this one. I finally got a pronunciation right. Mackinac has often been forgotten about in the overall national park story coming and going before national parks really grew in popularity. But as has been the case with so many national parks over the years, efforts to preserve Mackinac Island started as a way to preserve it from the exploitations of private development. In this case, Michigan Senator Thomas Ferry, who grew up on the island, feared it would be exploited and destroyed if private interests had their way. He sought to protect the island as a national park to preserve its scenic and historic characteristics, as well as its more relaxed way of life. The kicker for this preservation effort, though, was that most of Mackinac Island was a military reservation already, a holdover from the days when the Great Lakes were more militarily important. Because the military was already on the island, it was decided they would be the ones to oversee its protection, which they did for 20 years. Until Mackinac Island no longer held any real strategic value to the military. Military wasn't in the parks business, they were in the military business, and so they just kind of packed up and left. They decommissioned the fort and shipped out the soldiers, leaving Mackinac National Park with basically no one to protect it. The idea was bandied about to just sell the land. I mean, tourism was and still is big business here, but those familiar preservation voices once again came to the rescue. In 1895, Mackinac National Park was deauthorized and sold to the state of Michigan, becoming its first state park and possibly the first state park in America. And lastly, we arrive at a pretty peculiar little park, that of Sully's Hill located along the shores of Devil's Lake in North Dakota. The land for this park was originally located completely within what is today the Spirit Lake Indian Reservation and on the site of another former military installation. But back in 1904, Congress opened up certain allotments of that reservation's land for homesteading. Except in the case of Sully's Hill, they included a peculiar little clause which read, quote, 
The president is also authorized to reserve a tract embracing Sully's Hill in the northeastern portion of the abandoned military reservation, about 960 acres, as a public park." End quote. Remember, this is 1904, two years before the Antiquities Act was passed, granting presidents unilateral authority to create national monuments. Here was Congress authorizing a president, in this case Teddy Roosevelt, to create a quote-unquote public park. They didn't specify national park, but there was really nothing else to call it. So when TR exercised the authority Congress had granted him, Sully's Hill just kind of defaulted to national park status. It was a teeny tiny little park, only about 800 acres, and it was located in the middle of nowhere North Dakota. Plus, as was typical with parks at the time, Congress didn't authorize any money to maintain or manage it or develop it or prepare it for visitors in any way. This was not a recipe for success. Sully's Hill National Park received hardly any visitors. So when the depression came around, the park couldn't even really justify the paltry amount of upkeep it could maintain anyway. It was deauthorized as a national park in 1931 and actually moved out of the national park system altogether to the precursor of today's Fish and Wildlife Service, where it remains to this day. It carries the name White Horse Hill National Game Preserve, in honor of the Dakota name for the geologic formation on which it sits. The park receives substantially more visitors today than Sully's Hill ever did, and is an important home to bison, elk, prairie dogs, and other wildlife. And thus concludes our tour of the five national parks which no longer exist. Aside from being a fun exercise in list making, what I think we can take away from these five parks is that the definition of a national park is ever changing. At the time when these parks were created, national parks were still new. We still didn't have clear standards on what should or should not be a national park. Maybe we still don't. These parks no longer meet our current definition of a national park but that doesn't mean these places are any less important to the story of national parks in America. These five parks are reflections of our own collective experience in national parks through the years. They are tied to this ever-changing, ever-evolving idea of what a national park should be. And the people who visited them and enjoyed them when they were national parks benefited from that idea. The idea of preservation and protection the idea that we would set aside pieces of our vast and varied landscape as parks for all the people to see and enjoy and experience. All right, uh, thanks for watching here to the end. If you want to learn more about parks and protected areas, uh, do be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It helps me reach more people with these stories so we can all learn about the benefits of parks. I also do have a Patreon if you would like to support my work more directly. You can also follow me on Instagram for pretty park pictures. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.